number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth, but this that it, it didn't really help much. Number 9, bed pans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst. You got to get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for 2 minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history, you're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she'd put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, yeah, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian laundry day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when laundry day came around. It was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry. Hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. 
and yeah. At number five, an eye for an eye. When it came to the legal process in medieval Europe, things weren't always fair. I mean, they tried women for being witches and prosecuted animals for various crimes. Their punishments were sometimes swift and just, and other times, they weren't. People back then believed that when found guilty of a crime, there were worse punishments than losing a hand or something. As I mentioned a little earlier, they were quite fond of public humiliation, but they also believed in issuing fines and even kicking someone out of the community altogether. If someone was found guilty of a violent crime, then they would be subjected to punishment that would cause them pain as well, but not to teach them a lesson, but rather to brandish them so that they would be recognized as a person in the community who did that one thing to that one person. You know. Since since these people were very religious, they also had to make up with God for whatever crime they committed as well, so usually that would involve fasting and then it would be up to Sky Daddy to determine if further punishment was needed. At number 4, The King's Evil Being a king or queen in the Dark Ages might seem like a pretty cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another, they had to worry about their bloodlines, and of course, the thing that everyone had to deal with illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil. And you're probably wondering, well, these kings weren't doctors, how did they cure illness? And to that, I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and they cured them. People thought that this was a miracle and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because the monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. At number 3, Toothworms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the dark ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only do they not have any proper medication or anesthetics, but you could also get the worst diagnosis your dentist could ever give you, and that was a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth to decay and that pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, is the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to rid the worm would be to take a candle made out of sheep's fat and various seeds, and then they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run from the heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the patient's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number two, judging tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with this idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the dark ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was pretty much nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been a different kind of tears called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overcome with emotion that they were moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it didn't disturb anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And finally, at number one, pee readings. This dark age tradition is probably one of the strangest ones I have ever heard, and you might come to think the same thing. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do the practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they could judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color and that meant everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. 
However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that your wine colored pee is a bad thing. At number 10, Veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well. They don't have a homing instinct. Whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles. So they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing, they're riders much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but you do you. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number seven, a June wedding. As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back Back then, so when majority of the population did finally, you know, wash up at the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well, other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore 
prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse but back then you didn't get anything and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. Number five. Dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently. But why are we even doing it? Do we know? Other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. And I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face, and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick, you ask? The radiation. They didn't know this yet. It was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face. Now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what? At least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches, the early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented 
until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. Kicking off the list at number 10, Boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, this is a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. They would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five. 
shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos that wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tefania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tefana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig? Then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a shit on a boat? Whale watching fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day, before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think. I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Rays is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Rays is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesbro Pons bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box. A warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. At number 10, shaming parades. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked and while someone behind her rang a bell chanting, shame. Ding, 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 shame. 
You know what I mean? It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's just human nature at this point. And obviously, back then, they didn't have any social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative. Very creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary. But the one thing that stayed constant was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the street and forced to drink their bad beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. How regal. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded and it was quite the spectacle. Now would you rather experience this or being cancelled on social media? Let me know. At number 9, bloodletting. Back in the dark ages, medicine just wasn't the greatest. Clearly, I mean they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe. Even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, so I'm not really sure I would trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get, so I don't think people were really complaining too much about their barber Joey down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent illnesses or diseases, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck out the blood of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I am so glad that we do not do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside my body, thank you. Now before we carry on talking about just how weird things were back in the dark ages, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far and while you're at it, maybe think about smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. On number 8, day drinking. Day drinking is a thing. You know, when you're with the homies and you pour yourself a glass of sangria and take a walk around the neighborhood in the middle of the afternoon. Not saying I've ever done that. It's usually a once in a blue moon type of deal, but for people in the dark ages, day drinking was an everyday affair. Now, people back then weren't necessarily drinking at all hours of the day just to get plastered and stay plastered. It was actually for health reasons. You see, people tried to avoid drinking the water at all costs over fears of illness because the water just wasn't clean and wasn't safe to drink, so they turned to the next closest thing that they could drink and that just so happened to be alcohol. Back then it was common to drink large amounts of beer, cider or wine, and it was common to be drunk all of the time. Thank god we can safely drink water now because I don't think anyone could handle the hangover that came with all that heavy drinking. At number 7, no pleasure. The dark ages were heavily immersed in religion. In medieval Europe they took Christianity very seriously and people followed the church very closely. The mission of people back then was to live a good Christian life and to not commit any sins, but one of those sins was a little unfortunate when you look back on it. Back then any sexual acts that were meant for pleasure and not for procreation creation was considered a sin. That meant that sexy time was reserved for furthering the population and that's it. And if you did anything recreational, you would be getting a one way ticket to hell. Along those same lines, it was also believed that female domination was also a sin and so the woman could not get on top, or again, straight to hell with her. One saint, Francesca Romana, was so afraid of experiencing pleasure when she slept with her husband that she literally burned her lady bits with hot fat so that it would make the experience as miserable as possible. That sounds horrible. At number 6, cemetery fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube? Huh? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place that everyone goes for fun. The cemetery. Yep. You're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately they're not corpse husband, although corpse if you're watching hit me up. Thank you. Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because the graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, but it was almost the equivalent of going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the dark ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. 
Number five, blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return for these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious. Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, there were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Dominion, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD, their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a Nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, place your bets, people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go Zzz! and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah, take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was gladiators had a code they had to follow and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because gladiators were expensive investments and seeing your prize fighter that you've like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're good to go, right? Cool. How However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had one in five or one in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. And finally, coming in at number one spot, naval battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the, you know, pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged naval battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded, which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. Then these ships would come out and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. Can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and 
bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags. Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trap doors to hide animals inside of. What a nice upgrade, what a show. Also, this is terrifying. Number 10, spinning. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching Western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like browny green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France, worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ha ha ha, though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably, I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, so good, you're like, why'd you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses in your body were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. 
Oh, I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the Night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go Go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Bree mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks, Abe. Good job. Good report. 
The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn. Kicking off the list at number 10, wiper no wiping. On part 3 of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy had a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We've talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers are responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, Doramad toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. 
Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered in their destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven, shards and shards. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. Eh, think again. This is a part four, and honestly, I could do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my god. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all. Not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're gonna be, What's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, there you go. At number five, unfinished. From what we've learned about Leonardo da Vinci, he seemed like the type of person who marched to the beat of his own drum. He did whatever he wanted, when he wanted, and no one could tell him otherwise. Or at least that's how I perceive him anyway. But I think that this perception of him could also be backed up by the fact that he apparently rarely ever finished his work. Apparently, da Vinci was known to leave commissions and his own personal works unfinished. He was a meh, not really feeling this one right now kind of guy. Turns out the Mona Lisa was actually a commission project from a wealthy silk merchant to the Medici, and he never received the painting. Some of da Vinci's other works, like the Sforza Horse Monument and the Battle of Anghiari mural, were also abandoned and never completed by the artist. As you can imagine, his clients would often hound and harass Leonardo for the completed pieces that he often never even started. He got so tired of painting later in life that he said that he could not even bear the sight of a paintbrush. I have to say, I kind of feel bad for the people who never got their commission pieces because I'm sure they would have been quite incredible. At number four, Salvatore Mundi. Here's another one of Leonardo da Vinci's pieces that is shrouded in mystery. Salvatore Mundi is one of da Vinci's paintings that has a lot of unanswered questions. People have wondered about the orb in the painting that's held by Jesus. People who know of da Vinci's work notice that there is no refraction in the orb, which is uncharacteristic of da Vinci because he knew all about the physics there. But this mystery opened up a whole new jar of worms and a new question that is, did Leonardo da Vinci even paint Salvatore Mundi? And the answer is actually no. I know, crazy, right? For all these years, we thought that this was a da Vinci original, but it turns out that only about 20% of the painting was actually done by da Vinci himself. After analyzing the painting's artistic details and painting techniques, it is believed that Leonardo's assistant, Bernardino Luini, was the one to paint the majority of this piece. Luini was a painter in his own right, but his pieces never really fetched as much money as da Vinci's. Adding to all of this painting drama though, it is believed that Leonardo only completed about 15 paintings in his entire lifetime, so there's something to think about. At number three, dissection. 
Much like a lot of thinkers from back in the day, Leonardo da Vinci was curious about anatomy. His studies of anatomy first began as research for his paintings. He wanted to be as accurate to the human form as possible, and apparently he was quite a stickler about that. But later on, that research turned into a full blown fascination for da Vinci. He went from merely researching anatomy to seeking a deeper understanding of the physiology of living things. As part of his research, Leonardo da Vinci was known to dissect human and animal bodies. He was fascinated by physiology and there was no limits to how far he would go out of curiosity. He was known to have removed a human eyeball and sliced it open to better understand its function and how it worked. Quite strange, but clearly it helped him out in his art, so as long as the people he was dissecting had already kicked the bucket, then all power to you, Leo. At number two, where is Leonardo? One of the biggest mysteries about the end of Leonardo da Vinci's life is where the heck is he? No one really knows what happened to the famed painter's remains. His tomb no longer exists and his bones are nowhere to be found. When he died, he was buried at the church of Saint Florentine in Amboise, France, but in the early 1800s, after years of erosion and revolutionary vandalism, the chapel needed to be repaired and they used gravestones and tombstones to repair the building. Children were known to play with the abandoned bones from the graveyard and so a gardener gathered the bones and buried them. None of the remains have really ever been pieced together, so they remain lost. It is believed that Leonardo's remains could have ended up in the castle of Amboise, but we don't really know if they're actually his remains or not. And finally, at number one, ciphers and encryptions. Leonardo da Vinci created a lot of mysteries for us to solve in modern day, but he was quite the mysterious man himself because he was known to use codes and encryptions. All of his notes were written backwards with a mirror, and though it isn't known for certain why he did this, many believe that it was to protect his inventions and other notes from falling into the wrong hands. Though it's a pretty easy encryption to figure out, to the average wandering person, the notes would have just looked like gibberish. Other people believe that he wrote everything backwards because he was left handed and it was just easier for him to write backwards. Leonardo just did everything differently, which made him a little weird to some, but a genius to many others. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion. So, how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealth wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh Hatshepsut because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth though recently in 2015 when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdou El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight, Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum, a little piece of Egypt 
Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, that's like 4K Egypt. That's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust, scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered. A totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with the little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold Gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After the radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasures, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee, because it's so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years. The bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's meal times, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. 
I'll let you be his job. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have, no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction obviously today, horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls, but where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. At number 10, cutting fingernails. Each civilization had their own specific beliefs, religions, and rites. For the Vikings, their belief in Norse mythology impacted a lot of their daily lives and even their burial rituals. One specific prophecy from their religion depicted the end of the world, and as anyone would, they tried to avoid that at all costs. In Norse mythology, Ragnarok was their version of the end of the world, and during this event it was foretold that a lot of stuff was going to happen, like giants and demons approaching and attacking the gods, and a ship called Nagfar would carry a fleet of giants. This ship was said to be made of the fingernails and toenails of the dead, and the bigger the ship, the more giants would come. Out of fear of this happening, the Vikings took every precaution to prevent Ragnarok and subsequently the arrival of this fingernail ship. To do this, the Vikings built into their burial rites a very important step, cutting the fingernails of the dead. The Vikings had to remove the fingernails of the dead so that they couldn't be used to build the giant ship, but other than their removal, no one really knows what they did with said fingernails. The Vikings were also said to have kept their own fingernails clean as to prevent the same outcome. At number 9, teeth filing. Many civilizations had body modifications as part of their culture through time. Mesoamerican civilizations were known to shape their skulls and alter their eyes, women in China altered the shapes of their feet for many years, and so many cultures around the world adorned themselves with tattoos, piercings, and scarifications. In Viking culture, their body modifications often included dental work. Evidence suggests that some Vikings filed horizontal lines into their teeth and some of them filled those grooves with red dye to make themselves look even more terrifying. Because the Vikings were known to be voyagers traveling the seas to new lands, some anthropologists believe that the Vikings may have picked up their idea for dental modification after making contact with people in West Africa as many tribes over there were known to file their teeth into different shapes. Would you guys ever do something like this or would you rather leave that up to the Vikings? Now before I continue telling you guys about the weird and crazy things that the Vikings did, let me first ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far and maybe also consider subscribing to the channel to see more awesome videos like this one. At number 8, Carbon Monoxide. The Vikings were pretty good builders, mainly of ships. Their ships were huge, intricate, and very impressive, but where they excelled in shipbuilding, they lacked in the construction of their homes and community buildings. Apparently, the longhouses that they built for their communities were actually pretty unsafe to be in and trapped a lot of toxic gases inside of them. 
Researchers from a university in Denmark recreated one of the Vikings longhouses and lit a fire in the center of it like the Vikings would have done back in the day. After simulating an average living environment and monitoring the atmosphere inside of the longhouse, they realized that there wasn't enough ventilation to prevent carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide from building up inside. This would have led to a lot of people getting sick, especially those who spent long periods of time inside. The Vikings didn't know that though, but they also had their own remedies for curing sickness, so I don't think that they would have thought much of it. At number 7, Onion Soup. Speaking of Viking home remedies though, they had some pretty interesting ones. Every civilization had their own takes on medicine and healing their sick and injured, and the Vikings were no doubt the same. For them though, soup was their tool for healing, and for x-rays. Sort of. These days we eat soup when we're sick to warm up our bodies and balance out our sodium levels and doctors have actually proven that eating chicken soup actually does make you feel better when you have a cold, but Vikings didn't really have the same idea. For them, onion soup was their thing and they used it to diagnose people. Viking healers would make up a pot of really strong onion soup and feed it to a warrior who had a wound around their abdomen. Once the person drank the soup, the healer would see if they could smell the soup through the wound. If he could, then the wound was fatal and there was no sense in trying to save the person, so they would just move on to the next warrior. It saved the healer time trying to attend to everyone, but it kinda sucked for the person who got left behind because not only are they not going to make it, but their last meal was that awful onion soup. At number 6, Blood Eagle. We all know that the Vikings were a ruthless group of people, but their methods of execution really painted a clear picture of how terrifying these guys were and how they had a colorful imagination when it came to imagining new ways to unalive somebody. The Vikings came up with a method of execution called the Blood Eagle, and yes, it is just as terrifying as you would expect with a name like that. The Blood Eagle basically involved cutting someone up to make it look like an eagle. They would cut apart the rib cage and then spread it apart to make it look like wings, and then after that, while this person was still alive, mind you, they would pour a salt solution over the wound, pull out the lungs, and arrange them over the rib cage to, again, make it look like wings so that this person could flutter away into the afterlife. Now the mysterious part of all this is that historians aren't exactly sure if this was actually a real method of execution or if it was just embellished in Viking records to make them sound cooler. I for one hope that it wasn't actually real because that sounds brutal, but when it comes to Vikings, you never really know. Number 5. A Toast My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears, you're like, why? Why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the 6th century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number 4, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away so to speak. In the past fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number 3. Wedding Cake 
As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored. Then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you are going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my god, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f these Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them, a little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength, because they were Rock hard, and obviously, you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Murdochs. With the high profile of this ongoing case, coupled with the fact that Netflix just released a chilling documentary about the story of this family, it is likely that you may already have quite the idea of who the Murdoch family is. Taylor and I have been watching the documentary series. We're past the first few episodes, and man, is this story wild. A few years ago, if someone asked you who the Murdoch family was, you would have likely described them as one of the most powerful families in South Carolina with a legal dynasty that has spanned for a century. Now, if I asked you that same question, the answer would be a family who had it all. Money, power, status. But some of the members flew a little too close to the sun, tragedy ensued, and now people have lost their lives lives and the family has been destroyed. It started back in 2015 with the death of Stephen Smith. It carries on to 2018 when Gloria Satterfield, a long serving employee for the family, was found passed away after a quote, trip and fall accident. These events are both horrible and completely atrocious, but despite the rumors, mysteries, and alleged conspirators of these deaths, things really started to unravel for the family in February of 2019 with the death of Mallory Beach. The young woman met her untimely fate after a boating accident 
incident where, allegedly, 19-year-old Paul Murdoch was at the wheel, intoxicated. We could spend hours and hours talking about this family and all of these cases and the conspiracies, but we are short for time, which brings me right to the most recent tragedy. The 2021 killings of that same Murdoch who was driving the boat, as well as the killing of his mother, Margaret. Now, I do believe that people are innocent until proven guilty, but it is important to note that the one on trial for these killings right now is the father and husband to the deceased, Alex Murdoch, the patriarch of the family who is supposed to be carrying on that Murdoch legacy. The stories surrounding this family are horrific, tragic, and a reminder of the dangers that money and power can bring. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Sacklers. This family is the one behind the dynasty of Purdue Pharma, who is best known for producing an exceptionally strong prescription painkiller. Of course, we all know just how big and rich a pharmaceutical company could get, especially one that has been around for quite some time. The company was first created in 1952 by three Brooklyn-born brothers, and in the beginning, the company mostly dealt in things like laxatives and earwax removal methods. Soon, things for the company took quite an upwards turn, and before anyone knew it, the family was regarded as one of the most esteemed New York families, but they were also known for their philanthropic tendencies, with their names on museums and hospitals, some of the most famous in the world. You see, the thing is, when they released this painkiller in 1995, it led to them amassing an insane $13 billion fortune. That is obviously incredible, but the trouble came when it was realized that this painkiller wasn't nearly as potent as it was marketed to be, and frequent users would be building up a tolerance to it, meaning they needed to use higher and higher dosages. Viewer, welcome to the opioid crisis. Basically, this all spiraled out of control and led to many, many lawsuits coming against Purdue Pharma. Not only by individuals, but by January 2019, 36 states were suing the company for what the painkiller had done to their citizens. After two years of deliberations, the Sacklers finally reached a deal with plaintiffs in bankruptcy court in September of 2021. As part of their Chapter 11 proposal, they agreed to pay $4.5 billion and give up all ownership of the company in exchange for complete immunity and all future opioid liability. Despite this fall from grace, the Sacklers were able to move an alleged $1.36 billion into offshore accounts, so despite their bankruptcy filing and the large sum of money handed over, they will continue to retain quite a large amount of their personal wealth. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Bakers. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were once the most famous televangelists in America, and they certainly were living in quite a lap of luxury. They had beautiful homes, expensive cars, and a ton of money, but that quickly came crashing down amid horrendous scandal. In the late 1980s, after much success, Jim Baker resigned from the PTL ministry after there was a cover-up to hide some hush money that had been given to church secretary Jessica Hahn over an alleged essay situation. Of course, not necessarily a surprise, but definitely not a good look for a televangelist. This led to more interest in people looking into the family more, and soon it was uncovered that there was some sort of accounting fraud going on as well. The consequences for this came by way of felony charges, conviction, imprisonment and divorce. That was the end of that legacy, but since serving his time, Jim Baker hasn't exactly slowed down. He not only remarried and returned to televangelism, but he also currently hosts The Jim Baker Show, which focuses on the end times and the second coming of Christ while promoting emergency survival products. So. That's interesting. In our number 7 spot today, we have Prince Sado. Born in 1735, Prince Sado was the heir to the Korean throne, but unfortunately, he would go on to suffer from extreme mental illness and delusions. Thankfully for historians and those of us interested in history, the wife of the prince created memoirs, and in them, she detailed the horrifying things that happened next. The prince began to kill. He began to hurt and torment people. He basically turned their home into a house of horrors. The prince also endured some pretty horrific treatment from his own father, which of course is not an excuse for the things he did, but it definitely did not help the scenario. Eventually, the family had enough and realized that his behavior would go on to ruin the name of their family forever, so something needed to be done. At the time, tradition stated that if the prince were to be executed, his wife and child would also need to be, but everyone thought that maybe that was a bit too far. Why should they have have to pay for his crimes. This led to the king coming up with quite the bizarre workaround for this. On a hot day in July, the king forced the prince to step into a rice chest, which was then locked behind him. This acted as a way to make it seem like he had caused his own death, which is said to have occurred just a few days later. In our number 6 spot today, we have Don Carlos. This little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kinds of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias 
Louis in the mid 1500s as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors though are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things like hurting or taking the lives of animals for fun. Nowadays we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then it was like, I don't know. Was anybody even watching you, really? It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Soon, of course, his cruelties would extend to humans, with people claiming that one time he chose to harm a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. Major King Joffrey vibes in that one. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made that the prince didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided that there was absolutely no way in hell. Like, he was so bad that she would rather marry his dad. Which she did, in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement where he passed away six months later. Number 5. Keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there the rats begin frantically searching for a way out but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through so you can paint the picture in your head it's disgusting Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big, closed cauldron. And usually, it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie, too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. 
So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bowl and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. And I hope you are too. If a part two is in your deepest desires, hit that thumbs up and I'll come back and throw up a few times and talk some more smack. Number 10, three fights in a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, they uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave. Like right there, front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number nine, no heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season two back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or, you know, smile. That's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena, where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah. stop. Number eight, vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 was a a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this night Nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities, and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex bombs. Ooh, ooh, beefy men. Yeah. Roman women believed that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators 
won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Woo! Number 5. Original Plans Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close. Let's just give me a shovel. I'll get in there. I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three. Brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut. So there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten. But we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two, her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believe that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Kicking off the list at number 10, together at last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny, just bad. 
Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks. Can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of ones knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, building fires. The Vikings were some pretty innovative people, but they were also kinda gross. This gross behavior applied to a lot of things, but one of those things was their fire building. Now you're probably asking yourself, Bree, what's so gross about making a fire? Well, it's the way that they started the fire that was kinda grody. You see, nowadays we have a bunch of things that we can use to start a fire. We have matches, lighters, lighter fluid, and a bunch of other things. But obviously back in the days of the Vikings, they didn't have those fire starting tools, and so they had to improvise. 
The Vikings came up with a nifty little trick to start a fire where they took a fungus called touchwood and they would beat it and burn it until it turned into a thin, flat thing that kind of looked like felt. Then they decided to get gross and would then boil the touchwood in human urine because urine contained sodium nitrate, which would help the touchwood turn into something that would smolder rather than burn. They could then take this stuff with them and use it to start fires whenever they wanted so they could cook food over their urine fueled fire. Sounds delightful. At number four, conning. Conning people has been something that's kind of been part of many societies since probably the dawn of civilization. Anyone can con anyone into doing anything or buying anything. I mean, people do it on eBay all the time. But apparently, the Vikings were also known to con people probably for their own enjoyment, because they're Vikings. Back in the day, the Vikings would do trades with the Inuit people and they would acquire narwhal tusks from them. The Vikings would then sell those tusks to other people, marketing them as unicorn horns. And let's face it, no one's gonna turn down buying a unicorn horn. Because of the Vikings and their conning ways, by the Middle Ages, people not only believed that unicorns were actually real, but that they also had magical powers. So in a way, if you were obsessed with unicorns as a kid, you can thank the Vikings for that. At number three, house bears. Humans seem to be pretty good at domesticating animals. We domesticated dogs by accident, and now they're considered man's best friend. We domesticated livestock for food and other purposes. We domesticated horses to be our transportation and carry things. So we kind of know our way around animals and could probably make anything into our pet if we really wanted to. But the Vikings weren't just satisfied with dogs, horses, and livestock. They were the mighty Vikings and they needed mighty pets, and that's why they kept bears as their companions. Yes, bears. Now don't get me wrong, the Vikings also had normal pets like dogs and cats, and they would even sometimes bring them along on their expeditions, but they also really liked bears. It is said that when they weren't out laying siege to someone's town or sailing the seas, the Vikings would visit bear dens and take bear cubs home with them. They would then raise the cubs as house bears. But having a house bear was also a very big responsibility. You had to make sure that your bear was kept in check at all times, so that meant no eating people or livestock, no disturbing your neighbors, and if your bear did get into trouble, you would either get hit with a fine or be banned from having a house bear. So maybe it's best to stick with normal pets like dogs. At number two, worthy kids. The Vikings were ruthless even when it came to their spawn. I mean their kids. These guys were really picky when it came to having a family because they weren't afraid to just yeet their kids if they didn't like them enough. Back in their day, when a baby was born, they would christen their kid with a name during a ceremony called Asavatni, but only after determining if this kid was even worth raising in the first place. You see, when a baby was delivered, the child would be placed on the ground for the father to then pick up and examine. He would be looking for any physical deformities, disabilities, and to determine if the kid was actually his or not. He would decide if the kid had a future. If they did, then they would hold the Asavatni ceremony where water was sprinkled on the kid's head and given a name, and if they weren't worth Worthy, then they would be left outside in the element and abandoned. And finally at number one, criminal profiling. It turns out that the Vikings kind of invented criminal profiling. You see, when the Viking horde would set off to battle, there was no telling how they would return. You have to remember that these guys were bloodthirsty and violent and there was no telling what was going on in their heads. I mean, don't even get me started on the whole berserker rage thing because that itself is very intense. But basically, when the Horde would return home, they seemed to have caused a lot of problems because many of them couldn't turn off their rage and would just wreak havoc on the town. To deal with this, it is said that a series of Icelandic sagas were written as a sort of profile to warn the homegrown Vikings of what to look out for when the others would return. They had to kind of alter their stories a little bit because if they were too specific, then it would have caused people to learn to be afraid of basically any Viking man. So they had to keep things a little generic, but for the most part, people learned to stay away from those who couldn't turn off the berserker rage at home in order to keep themselves and the rest of their community safe. Now before I wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment telling me what the most fascinating thing that you learned from this list was. The Vikings did a lot of questionable and mysterious things, so let me know what surprised you the most down below. At number 10, inventions. Leonardo da Vinci was quite the smarty pants. We all know him mostly for his paintings, however he was so much more than just a mere artiste. Da Vinci was famous for his designs and art, as well as cartography, geology, and other studies. What's most impressive about Da Vinci are his inventions because he drew or described a number of devices that wouldn't be fully realized until centuries later. 
Some of his inventions include an underwater diving suit, like a scuba suit, an armored tank, a calculator, the machine gun, a keyboard, construction crane, a robot, and a flying machine. We have all of these things today, but back in Da Vinci's time, these inventions were quite bold. Leonardo conceptualized the armored tank 400 years before this invention was actually realized and used in World War One. Many of Da Vinci's inventions went unpublished during his life, and his notes and inventions were just passed on and created without giving Da Vinci credit. But as we find more and more of Da Vinci's lost notes, we are seeing just how many things he was inventing and how he's shaped our world so significantly. I wonder what other things Leo invented that we don't know about. At number 9, his lovers. Not much is known about Leonardo da Vinci's personal life. We know that he was never married, but that doesn't mean that the artist didn't have a love life. It is believed that da Vinci had a couple of lovers throughout his life, but there's no solid proof, only speculation and theories. Though we may never know for certain what his sexuality was, there are theories that suggest that da Vinci was into men. Many people believe that at one point da Vinci had some kind of relationship with his mentor, Andrea del Verrocchio, outside of their mentor-mentee partnership. There is also speculation that two of da Vinci's students were also his lovers, Gian Giacomo Caprotti and Francesco Melzi. Both joined da Vinci's atelier when they were 10 and 15 respectively, but it is believed that there were romantic ties between them. Caprotti is thought to have been da Vinci's favorite, and he even left Caprotti a mysterious inheritance in his will when he died. Back in Renaissance Italy, homosexuality was illegal, so if they were really Leonardo's lovers, they would have needed to keep things very secret. There was a report filed against da Vinci alluding to his sexuality, but because they were anonymous, the charges against the artist were dropped. Before we carry on talking about the mysterious life of Leonardo da Vinci, let me first take a moment to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mona Lisa Smirk. For some reason, people for years have been so obsessed with the Mona Lisa and her mysterious smirk. I mean, I don't really get what's so mysterious about it, but apparently it has been a hot topic in the art world. For years, people have been trying to piece together who Mona Lisa was and why she was smiling like that. Scans of the famous paintings have revealed many secrets, and countless scientists took a stab at trying to crack the case on this whole Mona Lisa mystery, but it seems like one person is thought to have figured out why Mona Lisa looked the way she does. Dr. Mandeep R. Mera, a physician from Boston, was standing in line to view the painting when he noticed her quote, sallow complexion, thinning hair, and misaligned smile. End quote. It was then that he diagnosed the woman in the painting with hypothyroidism. He suggested that her odd smile could have been connected to muscle weakness caused by her potential hypothyroidism. This combined with her thin and receding hairline, a bump next to her left eye, lack of eyebrow hair, yellow skin, and bump on her neck suggested that she was suffering from this glandular condition. To back up this theory, research was done on food that women would have eaten at the time that this painting was done, and because they ate a relatively iodine deficient diet, this could have caused the development of hypothyroidism since iodine is essential in maintaining thyroid health. At number 7, his mother. As I mentioned earlier, da Vinci's personal life had its own mysteries. One of the greater mysteries from Leonardo da Vinci's life is his mother. No one really knows who she was or where she came from, but there are a handful of theories. What we do know of his early life is that Leonardo was born on April 15, 1452. His father was Piero, a Florentine notary who was a famous womanizer, and his mother was Caterina. But other than her name, not much else is known about Caterina. The reason we don't know much about her is because she really wasn't in Leonardo's life. She spent little time with him and she sent him to live with his father. Historians have been able to narrow down a couple of people who could have been Leonardo's mother. She could have been Caterina de Mio de Lippo, who was a pauper from a neglected farm, or she could have been Caterina de Antonio de Cambio, who was the daughter of small landowners. It is also theorized that Caterina could have been a former slave from the Middle East because the name Caterina was a common name among women who converted to Catholicism. And since analysis of Leonardo's fingerprint indicated traits commonly found in people of Arabic descent, this could actually back up that theory. At number 6, The Last Supper. Many of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings are shrouded in mystery. There are many mysteries surrounding the Mona Lisa, other than the one I previously mentioned, and there are a couple of other pieces with a lot of unanswered questions, but let me tell you about one of the mysteries surrounding da Vinci's The Last Supper. The Last Supper is a depiction of Jesus and his disciples at the last Passover meal before Jesus' crucifixion. 
Though it looks like a normal painting, there are hidden Easter eggs that raise some questions. Dan Brown, the author of The Da Vinci Code, came up with a theory that Mary Magdalene is depicted in the painting. Mary Magdalene is thought to have potentially been Jesus' wife, and according to Dan Brown, the disciple in the painting that was previously identified as John was actually Mary Magdalene because this person had softer features that could be perceived as feminine. There is a counter argument to this theory, saying that the softer features in the painting were more so to depict the youth of the disciple John because he was the youngest of of Jesus' disciples. But what do you guys think? Is there actually merit to this theory? In our number five spot today, we have Prince John. It is said that this may be one of the darkest secrets of the British royal family. Prince John would have been the uncle of Queen Elizabeth II, but he passed before she was born. Prince John was the sixth child of King George V and Queen Mary, and it is said that he suffered from seizures, likely as a result of epilepsy, although it's hard to diagnose for certain because of all of the secrecies surrounding him and his illness. From the age of four, when he had his first seizure until his untimely and very early death, Prince Prince John lived in a separate estate where he was cared for by a governess. Many people have since criticized the royal family, calling their treatment of Prince John as callous or inhumane, like they were hiding him away for being ill. Of course, the palace was concerned with the monarchy's public image, and there was a belief at the time that royals shouldn't have any physical or mental ailments, although that is of course impossible. They also didn't include him in public events, which could have been another image thing, and also perhaps because of a worry that he might have a seizure at one of these events. At the end of the Day was definitely a different time, but the idea of excluding him because he was ill truly is a really sad thought. In our number four spot today, we have Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy. This is a royal scandal that took place all the way back in 1314, and it starts off with the daughters in law of King Philip IV of France. I think that's the fourth. Here's hoping. These young women, Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy, were accused of having quite a scandalous affair with two brothers, Philippe and Gautier. So, this already is some hot. Tea, but apparently when Queen Isabella of England, who is the daughter of King Philip of France, so I guess like sisters-in-law with these ladies, when she heard these stories, apparently she's the one who totally outed their affairs. It was obviously a huge deal and both of the women admitted to their adultery. This led to them being pretty much erased from public knowledge. They had their hair cut short and they were thrown in a dungeon, and even though Marguerite was meant to be the Queen of France through her marriage, when her husband ascended the throne, she stayed locked in the dungeon until the marriage could be annulled. Little is known about what happened to either of them after this point, however it is believed that Marguerite passed away in 1315 and Blanche 1326. As for the men in this affair, well, they met quite a gruesome fate that involved the removal of their bits and pieces before their swift execution. In our number three spot today, we have the Duggars. All right, one of the most famous reality TV families. And even before the horrors of this family came to light, they were already a family that had fame due to Quite a strange reason. If you're unfamiliar with who the Duggars are, you might be more familiar with the show that they used to have on TLC titled 19 Kids and Counting. Yeah. The show ran on TLC for seven years until it was cancelled in 2015, and the show featured, well, the Duggar family. The family consisted of parents Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar and their 19 children, 9 daughters and 10 sons, all of whose names begin with the letter J. It was an interesting time, and they seemed like this huge, happy, religious family. But in the years since the cancellation of the show, some horrifying things came to light. Initially, the reason that TLC suspended and then subsequently cancelled the show is because it came to light that the eldest son in the family, Josh, had done some horrible things and acted violently, horrendously, and inexcusably against a number of girls, even some in his own family. Due to the popularity of the show before these serious stories came to light, there was a spin-off show that was created titled Counting On. This show first aired in December 2015 and stayed on the air for a surprising number of years before it was pulled, and the family yet again found themselves in the center of a scandal that had to do with Josh. This time he was caught in possession of a certain kind of tape that no one should have, and that should not even exist at all. I can't say which kind of tape, but just know it's the worst of the worst. These are, of course, some of the worst scandals that have surrounded the family, but truly, it's only a drop in the bucket of the many stories surrounding them. In our number two spot today, we have King Juan Carlos. The former King Juan Carlos of Spain, when he first ascended the throne in 1975, was highly looked upon. He was said to be bringing a new age for the country, an age of democracy. His reign lasted for quite a while, but by the time 2014 rolled around, he was forced to abdicate the throne. This was due to a few reasons. Firstly, his public ratings started to 
to plummet after word spread of him being a bit of a womanizer and after an explosive affair, but also because of a lavish elephant hunting trip he took in the middle of an economic collapse. Okay. Fair enough, I can see why people were getting their guard up a bit. So the king abdicated the throne in favor of his son Philippe, who sits on it to this day. During this time, however, the scandals in the family weren't only to do with Juan Carlos. In January of 2014, another of his children, his daughter Infanta Cristina, was charged with tax fraud. She has since been acquitted, that happened in 2017, but she was stripped of her title as the Duchess of Palma de Mallorca, and this whole deal had her leaving Spain and moving to Switzerland. The drama doesn't end here, however, because her husband husband actually was convicted in the case with charges that included embezzlement, fraud, and tax evasion, and he received prison time in 2018. In the end, none of the fraud charges have ever been linked back to the former king, but this entire debacle did cause the former ruler to move out of Spain. With his move came a letter, part of which read, quote, guided by the conviction to perform the best service to the Spanish people, their institutions, and you as king, I am communicating my thoughtful decision to move at this time outside of Spain. A decision I make with sadness, but with great serenity. I have been king of Spain for almost 40 years, and during all of them, I have always wanted the best for Spain and for the crown. In our number one spot today, we have the Rothschilds. This family is easily one of the most, if not the most, powerful family in the modern era. In fact, it is said that most of us in the Western world don't even realize the impact this family has had on our lives, as our consumer-driven lifestyle is definitely directly related to the monetary systems this family put in place. This would include the United United States Federal Reserve. Because of this insane amount of money and power that this family has held for over a century, there are plenty of conspiracy theories going on surrounding them. The conspiracies run deep, and they go quite dark. They touch on everything from assassination attempts, some successfully completed on sitting presidents, to heinous World War II agendas that would have benefited the family. Of course, they are conspiracies, so no one is quite sure which of these secrets, if any, are true. Even still, the stories and speculation swirl world today waiting for some piece of evidence to maybe bring them to light. At number 10, the creation. Every religion and civilization from the dawn of humanity has come up with their own unique stories as to how the world was created. Some civilizations have credited aliens, others have credited a benevolent god, and many of these gods have their own unique ways of creating life. Though we've heard stories of gods creating people out of things like corn or mud or just thin air, I don't think these stories could even compare to the ancient Egyptian story of creation. These ancient people believed that their very first god, Atum, created himself. As such, he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with, and so to create his and thus create humanity, he, well, he busted Literally. He just gave himself a one to meat massage and boom. Out of that process, he created his kids, Shu and Tefnut. A very fitting name, if you ask me. This legend, I guess you could say, created the term the god's hand. And this was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. This term was also carried over into other civilizations, like in the Greco Roman period. So if you ever hear someone say god's hand, now you know where that came from. At number nine, cheating death. These days, if you get caught cheating on your partner, the worst that could happen to you is you break up, or you get a divorce, or maybe even get exposed on social media. But back in the times of ancient Egypt, the punishment for adultery was much, much worse than having your relationship end. Instead, your life would be the thing that ends. Obviously, in any civilization, any kind of relationship can always happen outside of a marriage. The only varying difference is the punishment for it. For the ancient Egyptians, being caught having an adulterous relationship was punishable by death. Pretty harsh for having a sneaky link, but I guess they took their relationships much more seriously back then. One of the most famous cases of a serial adulterer, if you will, came from a man named Peneb, who was known to sleep with many married women and even had his own son join in on his escapades too. As you can imagine, things didn't really end well for them, so if you ever go back in time to ancient Egypt, just be careful of who you sleep with. Before we continue talking about some of the things that your teachers might not have taught you about ancient Egypt, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, Ancient WAP. Last year, there was a huge scandal concerning Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion's song WAP. It's a pretty racy song that had a lot of people up in arms about it, and it was all over the news. I mean, if you ever heard any songs from the early 2000s, then you would know that this kind of musical content really isn't a new thing, and 
Little songs have been a part of society for a really long time, but it might surprise you to know that they even had some risque songs even back in the times of ancient Egypt. Historians have discovered some of these songs, one of which I can recite to you, and it uses some pretty imaginative wording to describe a woman's body. In an excerpt from said song, it says, quote, The one, the sister without peer, the handsomest of all. She looks like the rising morning star. At the start of a happy year, shining bright, fair of skin, love the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, her hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs, and narrow waist, her legs parade her beauty. With graceful steps she treads the ground, captures my heart with her movement." End quote. Now, it's no wop, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was pretty spicy. At number 7, The Ancient Hub. Back in ancient times, people needed some spicy content to make themselves happy, you know? Before we had only fans and the hub, people in ancient Egypt had their own adult content to enjoy during their alone time. This piece of content was called the Turin Papyrus, and it was essentially just a scroll of a bunch of images on it with people getting busy in some frankly unimaginable positions. Like, I don't know when the Kama Sutra was created, but I feel like the Turin Papyrus certainly gave it a run for its money. The purpose of this papyrus is pretty much unknown, but there are some theories to explain its origin and why it was created, some thinking that it had political ties or something. Either way, historians use this document to further understand times in ancient Egypt. At number 6, Magic Attraction. You know, we can't always have the best game when it comes to finding a partner. Sometimes it can be hard to get someone to go out with you. Many people just don't give up until they succeed, and sometimes that means that they will go to many lengths just to get a date with their crush. This was seen a lot in ancient Egypt, and at one point in later years of their civilization, they practiced magic to attract the one that they loved. Turns out that they practiced voodoo to get someone interested in them, and it was commonly done by men seeking out the woman of their dreams. In one case of this voodoo for love practice, a man had a magician make a voodoo doll of a woman that he wanted all to himself. The magician pierced the figurine with bronze nails and inscribed a tablet on it with a spell saying that this woman would not be able to drink, eat, or be with another man besides the one seeking her out. The spell also supposedly summoned a demon to follow her and pull her hair and intestines until she found her way to him. Sounds a little intense, but hey, I guess that's just what you do when you don't have Tinder. At number 5, Sneaky Link. In ancient Egyptian literature, women were often portrayed as seductresses. One of the more famous stories telling the tale of a seductress is one called the Tale of the Two Brothers. Essentially, the story goes that a man, his wife, and his younger brother all lived together. One day, the two men went out to do some farm work, and while they were out, the one man told his brother to go back to the house to get some grain sacks. When he reached the house, the wife noticed the brother and complimented him on his strength and tried to seduce him. The brother got angry and refused, but told the wife that he wouldn't say anything to her husband about their encounter. Still, she was worried that the brother would snitch, and so she made herself look like she had been beaten up, and when her husband returned, she pretended like the brother was the one who tried to seduce her. The husband got angry and threatened to kill his brother, but in an attempt to save his own skin, the brother told the husband the truth and even cut his bits off and threw his pee pee into the river just to prove his point, where it was promptly eaten by fish. Unfortunate. The husband then returned home to his wife, where he killed her and fed her to dogs. Not a happy ending for anyone, but it gives you a real sense of how adultery worked back in those days. At number 4, no Viagra. Just like anyone else these days, back in ancient Egypt, sometimes people had performance issues. Impotence was apparently a really big issue for many Egyptian men. It was such a common issue that sometimes it infiltrated their art and there were some scrolls and statues about it. An ancient Egyptian proverb was created about such a topic that said, quote, He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get any children. Now, obviously, there are things nowadays that can help with such an issue, but back then, people resulted to prayer and magic to help their little buddies out. Don't really know how well that worked out for them, but it's a struggle that a lot of people face, so at least they weren't alone. At number three, LGBTQ. As with anywhere on Earth, there were same-sex relationships, and the same goes for ancient Egypt. However, documentation of such things were far and few. The only 100% clear-cut case of same-sex relationships that was documented in ancient Egypt comes from the story of Horus and Seth. The story goes that Horus and Seth were both vying for the throne, and one night, Horus pretended to be drunk, while Seth tried to take advantage of him while Horus slept. 
Not the greatest example, but it's what we've got that's actually confirmed. Another potential recorded gay relationship may have come from Egypt's King Pepu II, who was thought to have had a secret relationship with one of his generals at nighttime. One of the most well known potential gay relationships from those times, though, comes from a piece of Egyptian art that showed two men touching noses. Doesn't seem like anything too intimate, but back then, touching noses was another way of kissing. The two men depicted, though, were thought to be brothers, so it's theorized that there was something a little spicy going on there, but we don't have to think about that one too hard. Item number two, dirty insults. What is your favorite insult? Don't be shy, you can tell me, this is a safe space. I guess I have a number of favorites, but one that I quite enjoy is saying that someone's mother is a horker, like in Skyrim. Back in the times of ancient Egypt, however, insults often included some kind of note. If they needed to hurl an insult at someone, they might say something like, quote, may you copulate with a donkey, or may a donkey copulate with your wife. People would also combine some kind of note with pointing out someone's flaws to create an insult. In a note found from one of the people who built one of the great pyramids, they insulted one of their co-builders by saying, quote, you are not a man because you cannot get your wives pregnant like your fellow men. Like, damn, that's pretty cold, dude. And finally, at number one, the magic pee pee. <laughs> Now, I had to save this next fact for our number one spot because it's probably one of the most bizarre things that I've ever learned about ancient Egypt. The Egyptian god Min was the male fertility god, and let's just say that he was quite unique. He was known for his bold feathered headdress and the fact that his loincloth snake was always being charmed, if you get what I'm saying. Men suffering from impotence would make offerings to him to help them with their fertility problems. Even to this day, figures of the god Min are used in magic rites. Men and women still visit the ancient temples to find figures of the god and literally rub his to overcome their problems. Sounds strange, but apparently so many people have done it that the stone that it's carved into has become worn down or darkened from how many hands have touched it. Now I can only imagine what this god's body count was. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? <laughs> no way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number 9. Act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, oh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare women do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind. Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was, especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, 
That's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow-up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution. Which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything, and if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second-rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it, because with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so, kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps, more commonly, after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child. Am I right? 
That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls to the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self pollution was a big no no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad. So, a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes! by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works, I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning, I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all, I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games, and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would hold weddings for them, and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage, and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, he's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey, you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not gonna know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did 
a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like, a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot. Like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy. Everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word. Philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it. Yeah. This man tried everything. 
to get a woman to sleep with him. He would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kind of just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways. This guy was super creepy because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair and he kept them all. Back then it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your Well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too, check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land, this guy had at all. Literally he had anything he could think of, but still he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason, and like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. We have At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day, and if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally, like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery, just standing there just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutronstein Castle. 
go check it out. It's literally a paradise. Number 10, the cutting edge. So I feel like I have to start here because this really was the prima donna of the revolution. One of the reasons the French Revolution became such a bloody event was due to the guillotine. It became the primary symbol of the French Revolution as the peasants exacted revenge on the aristocracy. It became known as the National Razor and Madame la Guillotine. Prior to the events of the revolution, executions were much more violent and cruel if you can believe that. One involved quartering, which uh, we won't get into, but you can imagine how bad that is if you take that literally. But Dr. Joseph Guillotine, a member of the French National Assembly, argued that there should be a painless and private capital punishment, and even argued against capital punishment in general. He didn't want it to happen. So Dr. Guillotine, along with a German and a harpsichord maker, Tobias Schmidt, invented the first prototype for the death machine. From there, the rest was history. It is estimated over 40,000 people were executed à la raison during the reign of terror. Pretty bad for a guy who really didn't want it to happen, but hey, at least it was painless. If the blade was sharp. If it wasn't, ugh. Number nine, the national anthem. Uh, you know what's funny about going to theater school is that the more you learn, the more your teachers are like, hey, if something bad happens to you, you can use it. It's fuel for your art. Which is what immediately what I thought of when I heard this story. Which is why, to me, it kind of makes sense that the origins of the French national anthem happened during the French Revolution. They used their pain to make something good. Going through something dramatic? Sing about it. The monarchies of Europe were pretty pissed about the fact that they were killing a bunch of their friends and loved ones, so they formed a coalition to defeat the resistance and restore the monarchy. The French Baron Philippe Friedrich Dietrich requested that Rouget de Lis, another French officer, Pose a song that would rally the troops. So he wrote the first anthem called Chant de Guerre pour l'Arme de Rhin, which translates to War for the Army of Rhin. Volunteers carried the anthem all throughout the streets of Paris as they marched on the capital. The song title got subbed out for the simpler one called the Marseillaise, which became the Republic's anthem in 1795. And now, even today, it is the national anthem of France. Number eight, the tennis court oath. You'd think it would be like at a pub or on the street. Why I think that, I don't no, but it wasn't. One of the earliest acts of defiance in the French Revolution took place on a tennis court of all places. To say that Louis XVI was ill-equipped to handle the financial debt that his father and his grandfather built prior to his reign is kind of, well, it's an understatement. He had no clue. He made a desperate attempt in 1789 to address the economic issues by assembling the Estates Generales. It was a national assembly with three factions, each one representing either the nobles, the clergy, and the commoners. The third estates, which is the commoners, had the most members and declared themselves the National Assembly. There was a long list, a long list of overdue grievances and they declared that they would force a new constitution on the king. Initially things were looking up as Louis legalized the assembly, but he locked them out of the damn meeting. So they moved to an indoor tennis court and took an oath to never disband until a new written constitution was formed for France. But very soon after that, they stormed the Bastille. But we'll get to the Bastille later. Number seven, give us bread. The French Revolution very much erupted due to the financial distress of the people. But the tipping point was the moment bread became unattainable to the common Parisian. Bread is a huge thing in France and it was a huge kind of staple meal for every Parisian. Marie Antoinette's famous misquoted response to the people asking for bread was, let them eat cake. Though it's debated whether she actually said that, it does summarize this yeasty flashpoint in history. They should have known better. In 1529, riots over grain in the Great Rebellion led to thousands of peasants destroying houses of the rich all in the name of grain. But they didn't listen to their history, they made it worse. The king was counseled by the physiocrats since the 1760s who firmly believed that the wealth of the nation was derived solely from the value of the land. Therefore, agricultural products should be highly priced. Uh. So they tried to intermittently deregulate the domestic trade to introduce free trade, but needless to say, they failed so hard. They caused food shortages and skyrocketed prices, which erupted in the flour war over 300 riots to pillage grain in 1775. Layers and layers of tensions were added, along with other economic distress and all this stuff, added to the fuel of the blaze that would be later the French Revolution. Number six, flip a coin. Now, the royal family obviously didn't go willingly to their deaths. They at first tried to escape. 
As I previously mentioned, bread was a big deal, and on October 5th, 1789, a large crowd of mostly women began to assemble at the markets. Why were they there? To discuss the steep price of bread. But they were dismissed, so they marched from Paris to the Palace of Versailles and stormed the place. They took out several guards and chanted over and over to the king, live among the people. Louis conceded, he said yeah okay, and agreed to go with them to Paris, agreed, kind of. But meanwhile, the royal family was placed under protection, and on the night of June 1971, the nobles dressed as their servants and their servants dressed as them, and the nobles made an attempt to escape to Austria. Now, if it were 2021, the king would probably have some arrogant social media so everyone would know what he looked like, but the commoners outside didn't. They had no pictures of him, so it was the perfect disguise. But his face was on every coin in France, and it was because of this he was recognized at the border and sent back. Now we know what happened next. Number five, last words. While she was alive, Marie Antoinette was abhorred, absolutely detested, they hated her. But funny enough, today she's incredibly well loved. Historians believe that due to rumors and hatred of the time, her character was misinterpreted. What do I think? Well, she was the product of the aristocracy that pretty much poisoned their own well. She was a bystander. But one of the moments that leads people to believe in her kinder nature was her last words. As Marie Antoinette walked up to the guillotine on October 16th, 1793, she stepped on the foot of her executioner by accident. Some say it was something else, but either way, her last words were reported as, I'm sorry. Number four, the Bastille. Bastille, Bastille, Bastille. What am I talking about? It seems wrong not to mention one of the most pivotal moments in the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille. Peasants rose up and literally stormed the most famous prison in France. But what you may not know is that they destroyed that building with their own bare hands. They tore it brick from brick because they didn't have any explosives. The Bastille was a fearsome 100 feet high, 8 towered prison that became a symbol for the tyranny of the aristocrats. So it was only natural that they would take out their anger on this place. At dawn on July 14th, a crowd armed with only muskets, swords, makeshift weapons gathered around the Bastille. Their intent was to demand the ammunition stored there from the governor of the prison, the Marquis de Lanay. He and his men were eventually overwhelmed and the people stormed it. Lanay raised a white flag and surrendered. He and his men were taken into custody, gunpowder and cannons were seized, and seven prisoners were freed. Lanay was destroyed by the mob before he even met trial. This pivotal moment in history is celebrated as the French national holiday, even today. Number three, Charlotte Corday, assassin of Marat. So we have established a couple things. One is that the French Revolution was bloody, relentless, and pretty terrifying. As much as it proved the statement that people shouldn't be afraid of their governments, but the other way around, Alan Moore, V for Vendetta, it wasn't a great place to be. Enter Charlotte Corday. Charlotte was a passionate supporter of the revolution, even though its main conspirators were set on killing the likes of her. Charlotte was, after all, a noblewoman, though she opposed the reign of terror. There were two sides to the fray the Girondists and the Jacobins, and Charlotte fought alongside the first, the Girondists. But the Jacobins were radical and tried to kill any and all oppositionists, the Girondists included. Which is why Charlotte decided that Jean Paul Marat, leader of the Jacobins, had to be taken out. She became an assassin. While Marat was taking a bath, Charlotte stormed in. She bought a knife and disguised as an informant went in to speak with him. She said she had news. At first, she delivered on her offer and told him of the escaped Girondists. At, he at once said that they would be guillotined and so she whipped out her knife and popped his bath bubbles for good. Corday knew she was going to be caught however and had told no one, not even her family, her plan so they wouldn't stop her. Charlotte was guillotined July 17, 1793 with her name attached to her dress so she would be recognized. She wrote in a letter explaining her actions, I desire only that my head, carried through Paris, may be a rallying standard for all the friends of the law. Number two, public zoo. Did you know that in the middle of all that crazy turmoil and public executions, they managed to find time to open a public zoo? In 1793, the National Assembly declared that all privately owned exotic animals will be transferred to the menagerie at the Palace of Versailles or killed, stuffed, and donated to scientists. Gladly, though, the animals' lives were spared and the menagerie was reopened as a zoo. It was free to the public and peasants got to go see exotic animals for the first time. Jacques Henri Bernardin de Saint Pierre 
Pierre, the founder, passionately believed that the public should be educated about exotic animals. Now, I can't be sure how well the animals were treated, I assume it wasn't very great, but this was technically the first zoo. Number one, Maximilien Robespierre. Now, it only seems fitting that we end this list at the end. Maximilien Robespierre started out with good intentions, but even though the revolution was about the dismantling of power, Maximilian became corrupted by it. Yes, he did topple the monarchy and put the power back to the people, but then he took it back for himself and got a little crazy, you know the whole thing. Robespierre worked as a lawyer in France and focused a lot of his cases towards the underprivileged classes. This got him a lot of popularity and he eventually rose to be the poster child of the revolution, the leader of the revolution. He became the head of public safety after Louis and Marie lost their heads and continued to accuse many members of the national convention of treasonous and unrevolutionary activities all over the place. Remember the whole thing between the Girondists and the Jacobins? This was that. In less than a year, 300,000 people were arrested, 10,000 died in prison and 17,000 were guillotined. I think those numbers might be slightly off but that's kind of what the research said. One by one he sent them all to the guillotine until he eventually was elected the president of the national convention. Within six days he passed a law that suspended the right to a public trial and to legal assistance and by the end of that month, and by the end of that month 1400 were guillotined. Talk about trigger happy. Finally the right and the left had to reunite in order to overthrow him. <laughs> and he was eventually met the blade himself. Number 10, let's start out setting the scene. So rather than rank the least to worst aspects of this year, let's set the scene of how this became the worst year. Prior to 536, the early 500s were in some pretty heavy transitions. The Western Roman Empire had fallen to German invaders and the Eastern sect would soon follow suit. The Middle East was divided between the Byzantine and the Persian empires. China's influence continued to spread through East Asia, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, even though it was experiencing a weak point, China was divided into both North and South territories and they were constantly at odds with each other. Africa, however, was developing trade routes through the Sahara and a powerful new kingdom was arising in Ethiopia. They wouldn't be heavily affected by this, but part of them would be. Peasants throughout Europe were used to the tradition of harvest seasons being reliable until one day all this movement and all this growth stopped. Number 9, The Mist. A mysterious mist rolled in over Europe, clouding the sky in darkness. With the mist, a century of darkness would fall. Literally sounds like the setting of a Stephen King novel. Byzantine historian Procopius wrote about a portent that took place that year and said this, and I quote, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse. For the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened, men were free neither from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. The sun was eclipsed for 18 months. For three hours in the morning it would give light, but a light that resembled neither day nor night." Unquote. Other sources describe a cloud or dust veil that darken the sky. Now, why did this happen? Here we are at number 8, eruption. Now, what on earth could have caused such a mysterious cloud of depression to seize the land? Well, after centuries of mystery, scientists have finally discovered what happened. It was a massive volcanic eruption that took place in Iceland. A professor of medieval history at Harvard University, Michael McCormick, led a study of a Swiss glacier which led to the discovery. Evidence of volcanic matter in the glacier proved that it was indeed a massive eruption that caused it. The ash from the eruption likely led to a fog that caused an 18 month period of darkness. It was so vast it spread across all of Europe, the Middle East and portions of Asia. Number 7, Climate Impact. This period of ominous and unexplained darkness led to serious negative transformations. A Roman politician by the name of Cassiodorus wrote that the sun looks bluish and that the moon had no luster. The seasons also seemed to be jumbled together into one. No summer, no spring, just a long, ever gloomy middle winter kind of thing. Another eerie fact he added was, and I quote, we marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon, unquote. The dark sunless days brought periods of cold with temperatures falling as low as 1.5 to 2.5 degrees celsius all year round, making it the coldest decade in the past 2300 years. This is the closest the world got to the winter depicted in Game of Thrones, besides the actual ice age of course. This was called the mini antique ice age. Number 6, starvation. But with the extreme cold, 
lack of sunlight and seasons, crop failure destroyed many lives. Farmers no longer could look forward to a bountiful harvest in the fall as basically nothing survived. The Irish Chronicles show that they had a failure of bread, bread of all things, from the years 536 to 539. Europe, parts of Asia and the Middle East experienced a massive famine crisis. When did things get back to normal? Well, it took over a century for things to really start to turn back. Eventually grit fell from the sky and slightly warmer temperatures returned, allowing for some crops to return. But the people had no way of knowing when that was going to happen. They just had to keep slugging along every day watching their friends and families slowly die of starvation. Not a good time to be alive. Number 5. <laughs> the Plague of Justinian but things weren't about to get any better anytime soon. It wasn't just crop failure and famine they had to worry about. Soon the bubonic plague was upon them. A couple years later in 541, the bubonic plague swept across Europe, adding more woe to misery. It became known as the plague of Justinian as it swept through the Roman port of Pelusium, Egypt, causing the deaths of half the Eastern Roman Empire's population. This in turn, according to once again Michael McCormick, sped up the final demise of the once great empire. The plague struck Asia, North Africa, Arabia, and Europe, taking the lives of a colossal 30 to 50 million people. And now there weren't that many people back then, so this would have really, really made a dent. The same disease would return centuries later and would be known as the Black Death. The reason it was called the Plague of Justinian this time around was due to the poor response from the Byzantine ruler. He was unable to complete the projects he had started due to the farmers and workers dying by the thousands, so he decided to raise taxes and change the tax code. He not only demanded taxes from the people still alive, but demanded they pay the ones owed by their fallen neighbors as well. So not a good time. Number 4. Some benefits. There were some. Now though scientists like to say this is the worst time to be alive in history, it depends where you were and it depends where you live. I mean, I keep thinking that maybe World War II was probably worse or World War I, I just don't know. But it was just such a long extended period of time. If you lived in the Arabian Peninsula however, you may have actually been kind of grateful for it, you know? Due to the catastrophe, their weather changed for the good. They actually experienced more rainfall. This helped their crop and vegetation thrive. They had so much left over, they could give more to their camels. As a result, they were able to build larger camel herds to help facilitate transport for Arab armies aiding in conquests during that century. It also may have influenced agricultural development in Estonia with their production of rye. In Finland, hunting and fishing were their main sources of livelihood, so the lack of land production didn't really bother them. They were like, okay, cool, I've got this uh, reindeer. Number three, snow in China. China, on the other hand, was freaking the heck out. It snowed in the summer. In the summer! I cannot imagine like a more depressing thing to happen, okay? I like I really can't. I mean, I remember one time in May, it snowed after like two weeks of just like beautiful weather and it snowed again after the longest winter. It was the most depressing moment of my life. Anyways, in some parts of China, the weather was so bad that 70 to 80 percent of the population starved to death. So on top of the famine, it was the weather and all this stuff. Despite this event though, South China seemingly remained peaceful and prosperous under the Liang dynasty, which lasted from 502 to 49. However, economic pressures and internal strife within the Northern Wei Empire continued to cause trouble. The Northern Zhao was finally defeated in 581 and the South asserted control over the North. This led to the final linking of North and South China when Emperor Wen began construction of a canal system connecting the two parts of China together. Number 2. Economic downturn. So obviously with the fact that agricultural production was way way down, workers were dying left right and center, an economic downturn soon followed the wave of plague and the mist. As previously mentioned, rulers such as Justinian raised taxes like crazy, burying his empire in debt. But just how bad did it get? Well the study of seeds found in excavations tell a pretty bleak story. They found a high number of grape seeds in the ancient trash map. So what does that matter? Well, by going through each seed individually, that's dedication, they noticed a steep rise in the amount they found and then all of a sudden a steep decline of grape pips. The Byzantine Empire for instance was pretty well known for the sweet wine that they sold and they had connections with other like parts of Europe that they sold it to which means the steep decline in the seeds indicates that their economic ties took a huge hit. And and last but not least, let's let's tie this whole thing together with survival. So how in the heck did we survive this thing? 
It was one foul hit after another. Bad weather, famine, plague, economic downturn, war, people being the worst. Well, a lot of it just had to play out on its own. The plague eventually died down, the planet started to slowly warm up, and along with those changes, the economy started to recover, though it would take over a century for it to actually be effective again. In the mid 7th century, Europeans began melting silver from lead ore, which led to the merchant class for the first time. This was a huge step. The Byzantines dedicated themselves to the preservation of history, and even though Justinian was the worst financially at the time, the critical reform he made regarding the legal system and those pesky construction projects set them on the right path for the future. Number 10, parties of poison. Hindsight is 2020. Which I find more ironic than ever since the whole thing that happened and is continuing to happen. Today we know that lead, especially in large doses, is not good. It's poison. But a lot of the pipes that the Romans used in their plumbing were made from lead. Their water had 100 times more lead in it than the water that came from the springs, which means every time they drank water, they were poisoning themselves. Some side effects include behavioral changes as well as weakening organs and vital signs, etc., which may explain some of the more questionable and behaviors or the fall of the Roman Empire because people got nuts. But to add insult to injury, the Romans used to sweeten their wine with something called sapa. Sapa is lead acetate, the sugar of lead, which is, and it's also a salt, which is confusing, and therefore poison. Since Romans could down as much as two liters of wine in one sitting, they were slowly poisoning themselves, first with water, then with the wine. Speaking of wine, moving on to number nine, we have you better love wine. If you're a vodka or a beer person, you might not fit in while partying with the Romans, especially if you hate wine. Wine was the lifeblood of ancient Roman parties. Wine was drunk at every stage of the Roman party, but it had to be diluted with hot or cold water. Unlike how we drink wine today, which would be crazy if you were to dilute it. Whoa. It was looked down upon to drink wine in its purest form. It was served out with ladles, usually by naked and attractive male slaves. To heat the water, the Romans used special boilers, but if you really wanted to be bougie, they would add snow to make it cold. Considering they didn't have fridges back then, imagine the lengths they would have to go to to keep the snow cold. Beyond temperature, Romans absolutely drooled for calda and mulsum. Calda was great for cold nights, it was kind of like a mold wine, it was served hot and infused with spices. Molda was infused with honey and a lot sweeter. I want to try and make both. Maybe I will on my Instagram. Let me know if I should in the comments below. Minus the lead of course. Number 8, seating charts. If you have ever been involved in a wedding, you know how important a seating chart is. Or like even in school, when you're like assigned desks, it's a big deal. You could end up sitting next to your uncomfortable cousin or beside your smelly Aunt Sue. It could determine whether the conversation blows or it's stagnant the entire night. Ugh, hate that. Romans understood the matchmaking game when it came to banquets. It was a pretty big deal. Where you sat determined your station and overall how liked you were. They had a three couch system called the triclinium. The most honored guests would sit on the couch in the center next to the hosts on the right. But if you were on the couch on the left, it kind of meant that you weren't as big of a deal. Sorry. Eventually as parties got bigger, so did the three couch rule extend to a huge semicircular couch in the middle that could hold about 12 people. Number seven, gladiator fights. We just did a video on this, Taylor and I, go check it out. Now, parties weren't just about eating, drinking, and socializing, there had to be entertainment, of course. Roman parties were designed around the five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So of course there were the ancient Roman bards jamming out some earworms, but what was there to look at? You could only watch someone play the harp for so long. Next up on the entertainment list was acrobats, dancing girls, even mimes, which I was surprised to learn, plus trained exotic animals. If you were more like the charcuterie and like a quiet evening kind of person, you might enjoy poetry readings. But what really got the party started was an epic gladiatorial battle. Nothing like putting sharp objects in drunk people's hands. But that wasn't all they did. Parties were a big deal and nobles loved to outdo each other, so sometimes they went too far. More than once it got out of hand, but the most famous was during the reign of Emperor Elagabalus. He wanted to shower his dinner guests with flowers, so he built a false ceiling filled with them, but the flowers somehow ended up smothering some of his guests to death because he just kind of went overboard. Death by roses. 
That's a poem title right there. Stick to poetry nights, my friends. Number six, Saturnalia. One of the most popular Roman festivals, it was kind of like an early Christmas celebration, kind of, except it wasn't at all. It was actually about the god Saturn, not Christ. Oops, but it did take place in December. December 17th, to be precise, for three days. But people loved it so much, it soon got extended to seven, a whole week. All work and businesses were suspended, so better do your shopping on the 16th. Slaves were even temporarily free to do as they pleased, even moral restrictions were eased. A mock king was chosen, and candles, wax fruit, wax statues were all given as presents. The practice of candle giving was to symbolize the sun returning after the winter solstice. A statue of Saturn bound at the feet would be untied and invited to join the party. The houses were adorned with wreaths and greenery, kind of like Christmas, and singing, dancing, gambling were all common features. So kind of like Mardi Gras and Christmas combined. Number five, the Black Banquet. A prank that went down in history. Don't worry, this is nothing like GOT's red wedding. Thank goodness. Emperor Dominican had a pretty sick sense of humor and decided to host a party about it. In 90 AD, he invited a crowd of aristocrats to a banquet at Palatine Hill. When they arrived, the entire palace was decorated in black. Black velvet drapes, marble, everything was painted black like the Rolling Stones song. Even the food was black and everything was illuminated by funeral lamps. Naked serving boys were painted from head to toe in black paint and served food and drink to all the guests. When they sat down, their place marks were, were tombs with their names on it and instead of lush couches, they sat on cement slabs. So basically he was like, yeah, sit in your own grave. Dominion had killed several senators in the past so everyone believed that they they were never going to get out of there alive. It was like a huge metaphor for their own deaths. The emperor himself babbled about death and decay the entire night. So after the party was over and the guests made it home with their necks intact, Dominion sent gift baggies with their tombstones and onyx plates and a now clean serving boy ready to do their bidding. Turns out the whole thing was a prank and the emperor was back at the palace laughing his butt off. Number four, Bacchanalia. The party that was so wild, it got banned. One word, orgies. The Romans dug that kind of kinky shindig, but they like to pretend they didn't. Bacchanalia, the back guy, is a term used to describe a drunken, debaucherous party at frat houses or sororities, which isn't far off from the heyday. The Bacchanal celebrates the god Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, literally the god of wine and a damn good time. The celebration could include massive feasts, ritual parades and performances, and people carrying clusters of grapes around, and of course, wine. Lots and lots of wine. It used to just be held by women three times a year, but soon men were slowly admitted to the festivities and they started making it happen about five times a month. But this was the breeding ground for scandal as it was rumored orgies and even human sacrifice occurred. So they were banned in 186 BCE, and if you ban something, you'll only make it more popular so the celebrations continued covertly. So if you're into that kind of stuff, maybe forgo the human sacrifice, but there it is. Number three, power play party. I've never lived within the aristocracy. I'm a blue collar gal. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be that rich, but I'm pretty sure this kind of who can throw the bigger party mentality hasn't really changed. In ancient Rome, parties were an opportunity to show off the amount of power a nobleman had. As soon as guests arrived, the extravagance and the rarity of the food, the vessels with which they were presented were all judged as soon as they were seen. Wine goblets and jugs had to be functional yet exquisite, made from luxurious materials like gold, Gold, silver, and precious stones. Back then, a middle class family could afford silverware, so imagine what the nobles could do. This display of wealth played the long game, and it could mean political favors could be made down the road. So, sneaky, sneaky. Number two, Party Island. This is where it gets really dark. Ever sipped on a Capri Sun? Well, this story may taint that memory, so fair warning. The island of Capri became a rich retreat for the Roman aristocracy, known for its sadistic debauchery. Emperor Tiberius laid claim to this island as a haven for his horrendous and horrific, horrific behavior. He brought really young, too young male and female people of the night to serve him at his villa. The island became a kind of party place with absolutely no limits. From orgies in the caves to tormenting his servants on the rack as entertainment, Tiberius seemed to be the god Pan incarnate. In fact, he acted like it too. He made all of his participants slaves dress up as nymphs and goats while performing lewd acts. The island even became known as Goat Island with Tiberius being called the Old Goat. 
Ugh. Unless you enjoy dangerous games and gross parties, this definitely wasn't the party island fit for anyone. And last but not least, number one, Caligula. Caligula's parties. Let's not go there. If you're a fan of Roman history, then you are familiar with the two most horrific emperors that ever were. One of them was Caligula. Though he started out pretty good, after an extreme bout of fever, his disposition entirely changed. Maybe it was because of the lead, we don't know. Many believed he was insane, as his cruelty knew no bounds, even when it came to joyous occasions. Caligula's thing was that he liked to embarrass the wives of his officials for some reason, and also his officials. He would force specifically married couples to his banquets, and then steal the wives away throughout the night and then violate them against their wishes. But his torment doesn't end there, he would then relay to the entire party everything that he did in graphic detail and enjoy the frozen shock on everyone's faces because they couldn't do anything about it. It's no wonder he was eventually assassinated, even at a party this guy knew how to kill the mood. He wasn't the only emperor to turn the dial on creepy, Tiberius, when the party started, but if you had to choose whose party to go to, this one plus Tiberius, both of them, just don't go near them. Go to another time frame. Just imagine it otherwise. Number 10, Steel Cage Match, brother. Okay, so it's the early 1900s and you're living in a rapidly growing city. Towers are popping up everywhere, and that means that there's less space for you and your baby to play in. Only if there was a way my baby could get fresh air and sunshine. Meet the baby cage, yeah. A small metal cage with a tiny mattress for your baby. The said metal cage is suspended on your windowsill, making the baby spend multiple stories above ground level. This, this is just a great idea. The idea behind this terrible idea was that the babies need fresh air and sunshine. Providing them with such was thought to improve their immune system and make them healthier. Besides the fact that the only thing separating your baby from becoming the worst rainfall event of the month was a thin metal cage. This is a prime example of why every product should be thoroughly tested and thought about before selling. Eventually, these did fall out of fashion, but in reality this wasn't that long ago, which is kind of crazy to think about. Number 9. Nuclear Time A lot happened in the 1900s. I mean, a lot. A couple wars here and there, the TV, the car. It was a busy century. A century full of discovery and invention. One such unusual invention was the radium dial, watches and clocks that were painted with luminescent paint, making the numbers and dials glow in the dark. Trouble with this new invention was the paint being used wasn't exactly safe, as it was made from radium. For the Breaking Bad nerds at home, radium is a highly radioactive element, even more so than the legendary uranium. So when a factory of women eager to get to work were told they were going to be painting watches with radioactive paint, do you think anyone asked for PPE? Truth be told, not everything was known about radium as it was only recently discovered, but what's so unusual is what factories told these women how to paint the watches. In order to give the brushes a fine tip, the women were instructed to use their lips to keep the brushes in perfect order, not knowing that day after day they were ingesting a very radioactive element. And in some sense of dark comedy, they sometimes had fun and painted their nails and on each other. I mean, it glowed in the dark, it was glow in the dark paint, it was new, it was cool. Over 50 women would become very sick from painting, and 12 sadly lost their lives. Number 8. I'm ready for my close up. Ladies, this one's for you. In this day and age with social media, loving your self image can be tough. There's tons of things that makeup companies and media do to make you want to be the people they want you to be. If you buy said product, of course. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't need all that. You're gorgeous just the way you are, and lately, honey, you've been slaying it. However, this marketing manipulation isn't new, and in the past, most certainly wasn't very subtle. Introducing the Beauty Micrometer, the latest from How to Horrify People Daily. It was actually invented by the famed beautician Max Factor Sr. Hell of a name. This steel cagey device was placed over a poor woman's head to then mathematically calculate the flaws that would be adjusted using makeup products. Obviously, these are no longer around and for good reason. I, I, I don't even have a joke for that one. That's just weird. Number 7. Back to the Future During the technological boom of electronics in the 1980s, there was one invention I think is really unusual. Computers, camcorders, and even home video game consoles were becoming commonplace all over the world. People who are familiar with retro Nintendo consoles are familiar with the likes of Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, or Contra. You may even remember a certain gaming accessory involving a laughing dog every time you miss a duck. What 80s kids might not remember is the Konami Laserscope. 
Similar to Nintendo's Zapper, but with two key differences. One, it's a headset instead of a pistol. Two, it's voice controlled, meaning when you come across enemies in game, you have to shout fire to fire in game. The Konami laser scope was bold and tried to be ahead of its time, but when taking a good look at it, one, it makes the user just look ridiculous, and two, it doesn't work. Reviews for the headset are not favorable and just defeat the purpose of using a headset. Today we have VR headsets that may seem just as ridiculous, but they work, and the use of voice still isn't a primary control used in games today. Number 6. Battleship Woodchip. This is one of my favorites. Okay, hear me out for this one. Back in the 1940s, there was a really super, not very fun, expensive war happening. Germany, Japan, and Italy needed to go into the timeout corner. But after a while of people trying to put each other in the timeout corner, things were getting super expensive. World War II was fought on all fronts, land, sea, and air. The sea being a key part of the war victory in the beginning of the war. Literally tons of war goods and ships were being sunk by German U-boats every day across the Atlantic. So in order to cut costs, what if the ships were built out of something cheaper, but just as tough as steel? Concrete, right? Nope, I bet you weren't thinking ice. Or more specifically, sawdust and ice mixed to form piecrete. Testing with piecrete had gone so well that in a super secret general meeting, piecrete was presented, shot at in the meeting, ricocheting a bullet causing another general a flesh wound. Having its defense capabilities proven in the war room, Operation Habakkuk was greenlit and the Allies were planning on constructing an aircraft carrier made out of ice and sawdust to help thwart the German U-boats. However, this was scrapped as a boat made of sawdust and ice would really not be much help against a German U-boat. Plus, where do you sleep? Can you cook on there? Way more questions than answers. Number 5. Hello there. Channeling our inner General Grievous, our number 5 spot belonged to the monowheel. Originally designed in the 19th century, it wasn't until the 20th century they slapped a motor on one of these bad boys and did their best escape attempt from Utapau. Sorry, I'm a Star Wars guy. It just looks like the vehicle from the third movie, I can't help myself. In reality, the monocycle is a single wheeled motorized vehicle where the driver either sits inside the wheel housing or right beside it. Today these vehicles are still around but really only used for entertainment purposes, as the design does have a few issues. One wheel gives balance issues, there's a visibility issue since, well, you know, you're usually sitting inside the wheel, and an issue called gerbling, which basically means if the driver brakes too hard, the inner ring will overcome its own gravity and the driver will do a full loop, similar to how a gerbil spins around on its wheel. Seeing that would make Monday morning traffic a lot more amusing though, I gotta say. Number 4. Deep breath my equine friend. World War 1 was the war to end all wars, except for the 10 major wars that came after it. Noted for being the bloodiest and most destructive conflict at the time, it gave humanity a bunch of cool and exciting inventions, so long as they were not being used on you. One of the worst things to come out of the First World War was the extensive use of trench warfare and chemical weapons, or more specifically chlorine gas. Trench warfare was brutal, not only in its barbaric over the top charges into machine gun fire, but also in its living. Trenches had terrible living conditions and were difficult to take from the enemy. Crossing no man's land was no joke. So to eliminate the pesky enemies entrenched in their trenches, the very cruel chlorine gas was used, causing nausea, violent coughing, chest pain, and corneal burns, just about everything you'd find on the back of normal medication, right? Gas masks helped when they were available, but unfortunately they were not the only living creatures on the battlefield. This is where our invention comes in. The very depressing invention of the horse gas mask. The idea is the same. Horses need protection too, and since World War I was still a war powered by horses, it was more common than you might think. And a lot of our equine friends perished alongside us. Number 3. Wilson! Some of you may have been cool enough back in 1975 to own a pet rock. Some of you may have not. Looking back, it doesn't really make any sense. Sure, everyone needs something to keep them company. Tom Hanks would have never gotten off the island he was stranded on if it wasn't for Wilson. Imagine a world without Tom Hanks. I, for one, would not want to live in such a world. All jokes aside, the Pet Rock was a genius marketing campaign, very similar to the fidget spinner of recent years. It's proof that if you can get a fad trade rolling, you can sell anything. Now, who wants some of my bath water? Number two, Chef's Kiss. Okay, it's 1958. Times are good. Cars have cool fins on them. Elvis is on the radio, and most of my post traumatic stress disorder has cleared up since the war was over. It's all great. Ah, yes, life is good. I can't wait to enjoy some modern cuisine. Well, let's see what's on the menu. 
I'll have to start with the frozen cheese salad. I'll have ham and banana hollandaise. And for dessert, I'll have the lime jello tuna pie. If that doesn't sound appetizing, I don't know what does. For some reason, halfway through the century, people just lost their taste buds. They were coming out with all kinds of disgusting foods. A lot of them are in low form for some strange reason. I think the grossest item that you can come across is a little invention called Hongar. Sounds like somebody from Skyrim, but nay good sir. Hongar is a mixture of honey and apple cider vinegar. It was thought to provide great health benefits. The only thing that would give me is a spot in front of the toilet refunding my breakfast. Oof. Number one, Krümelauf. Germany was having a really hard time in World War II. The United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, France, and Russia too were all coming to give the mustache man a piece of their mind. Heavily outnumbered, it was time for a miracle. Time to see what top German scientists had up their sleeve. We have a rifle that can shoot around the corners. Isn't it wunderbar? Yeah, this thing is real. A curved barrel called a Krumlauf, used for shooting around tight spaces like corners and out of tank hatches. During the waning years of the war, Germany was coming up with all kinds of crazy inventions to turn the tide. But a rifle that can shoot around corners probably isn't the answer. As mentioned above, the world was coming and they needed a lot more than a fancy pants rifle to stop the allies. History tells us that this invention did not work as Mustache Man is no more.